and we are live. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you to everyone who is joining us. Um, if you are just now getting here like we are, I would say welcome. Uh, we uh, were experiencing technical difficulties because my black behind was asleep. Um, and I think that that's something real. I think that's something you know, we need to talk about is like being okay with having real and transparent conversations about what is necessary. And to me, sleep was definitely necessary. Um, so I just wanna say thank you to everyone for joining us and um, a special thank you to my guests today, um, Bawen Suchak, and I just wanna say welcome to you. Thank you for joining me on the full set. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. And you, um, know, you, got, you gotta you gotta prioritize naps. I'm telling you, like if you get a nap, I can't believe you. like man is telling me it's okay. <laughs> you gotta take it if you can get it. <laughs> no, I totally appreciate it. Um, and I feel I, I feel terrible, but I'm not gonna beat myself up. Nah. That unfortunately, Jashiri could not be with us today because that probably you know inflates his time schedule or whatever. So I will be reaching out with an apology that I was sleep and. Um, hopefully we can get it together, but you and I have a lot to talk about today. And so I want to just jump right into it, being that I'm exhausted uh, by my full-time job, uh, the stresses of COVID, um, missing my baby and producing, I'm literally producing, I don't even know how you and the kids do this, producing a podcast that doesn't even exist yet because I'm waiting for logos and all the things for for itunes and spotify so how are you doing during the midst of the COVID 19 crisis yeah no you, you you're doing a lot um and i you know it's also just like an interesting um thing i've been thinking about uh and talking to like you know like my sister and talking to you know some other women in my life who are you know sort of like highlighting the roles of like women taking on additional tasks and sort of like COVID revealing the sort of like disparity and who does work and who does um that kind of thing and so I think like for me you know I've been you know I got a, I got a roof over my head I got food um my job is intact right now uh, youth fx was able to go remote um, on March 12th which where we've been working and we sort of moved all our operations um online and really kind of pivoting oh, y'all are role. online right now? Yeah, I mean, we do like after school programming, we do um, workshops, we've been doing this IG live on Friday. So tune in okay. on uh, this Friday at 7 p.m. We always show, we, yes, we post the we'll film post in the, the morning. Link. Yeah, we post the film in the morning um, from our archives of films um, that were produced by young people in the city of Albany. And then we um, do an IG live with the directors or the actors. It's been really cool. It's been like, I don't know, I just feel like there's this different level of engagement you have to adjust to. It's not ideal. Mm. Like there's always a great, you know, energy when you're in a space with people and that's what we love. But at the same time, like, you know, in a way it's about really getting your ideas and message out there. And I think right now, like, you know, people are looking for ways to connect with folks that are really doing grassroots work. Because I think like, you know, young people, especially through the process of storytelling have really been the ones who give you an actual viewpoint into what's going on in their lives. And I think like so much of youth culture gets corporatized, you know, by the media. And I feel like, how do we, you know, reclaim that? And that's to put the power in the hands of young people, which is what youth FX has been doing, right? So at this point, you know, the challenges that we're, you know, like we are, are screening our big premiere that happens every year at the Spectrum Theater that we were talking about earlier, that's been, you know, postponed. And that's the work that kids- Oh no. Yeah, so that's like our core um, big event of the year because it highlights all the new films that were made by our youth and our intensive that happens in the summertime. And then right now we're in the process of really kind of starting to think about the summertime. And I think a lot of youth organizations that we're in community with and have been talking to throughout this process are saying the same thing. Like they don't know what, you know, the summers are gonna look like. A lot of our programming really intensifies in the summer because we can have- All Right. Uh, will it be Will it be a hot youth summer after all? Right. <laughs> That's the big question we're asking right <laughs> now. And, you know, we're trying to kind of just like obviously abide by the state guidelines and pay attention to the, you know, health department regulations. And, and I think that's something that, you know, immediately we have to sort of adjust to that. But then I think the second part of it is like, how are young people going to be able to, you know, sort of be outside, how are they going to engage with each other in a summer right. where, you know, you're not going to be able to keep kids cooped up inside when you know, right. it's hot. And 
think just even thinking like on the detail level. So what we've been doing is we basically have a six, you know, six people on our full-time staff. Um, I'm like the OG, I'm the old dude in the group. Um, so I'm one of the- I know, I see the gray hairs, Bob. Yeah, it's been I, a I minute since I see you. <laughs> They're coming in. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I mean, that's the, you know, the whole model of YouthFX was built on youth leadership. And now, you know, the program is run by, you know, myself and five other young folks who are between the ages of 22 and 26. And they've been right. you know, some of the co-founders that started it as young people. And part of, you know, what they're trying to do also is, is find like, kind of like a redefine the purpose of our organization online. Okay. Because we are so people-based and we have a space, a studio space in the South end of Albany where we've been, you know, located for the last, you know. Which is huge. Oh, Y'all have like yeah. a- like and that an airport got, hanger. It's <laughs> kind of a wild space. Um, but, you know, it's got a studio, it's got a workspace, space, it's got an editing lab. And we have been really building up this program called Open Lab, which was a mix of workshops and drop-ins this year. And okay. To really just start our own after-school program because it's the first time we had a space after being in operation for 10 years. You know, we had a space. So this has been something that's really exciting. And like I was saying, we've been building lots of new ideas, workforce development programs. And okay. then, boom, this all, you know, we just went to COVID Sundance. just interrupted everybody's yeah, I mean, life. Yeah, and you know, and we were, you know, we had just done this big trip to Sundance and had some really exciting projects. Oh, y'all went to Sundance? Place. Yeah, we had our, this was the first time we took our whole crew and um, we were pitching this project that we've been working, which is a episodic um, television show that the whole purpose of that is to have it shot and filmed and produced in Albany as a way to bring um, workforce development opportunities for people in film and television. Because we have this alumni now, you know, group of young people that have gone through the program, who some of them work in film, some of them work, but it's a small market. It's Albany. It's not New York City. So we feel like the only way we can really bring some kind of industry up here is for us to sort of create it, you know. And I think that's part of the the kind of um, energy that we've always had is like self determination, you know. Like we got to create our own opportunities, and I think that's a to me one of the largest messages that we're learning through this pandemic process is you know, the larger structures that we kind of assume will take, you know, some kind of, you know, care of us, the federal government, you know, and even the state governments have not been doing that. Like there, there's no rent freeze, you know what I mean? Wait, wait, wait. Are you so, saying the government hasn't been taking care of us? No, I mean, that $1,200, I mean, shit, some people got that little check and, you know, like that'll make it through, you know, maybe a half a month's rent at this point. Come on now, talk about it, Baldwin. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, and, and the thing is, it's like, you know, we have to start thinking about, you know, I've been having, you know, because we're in these like, so we do these also, we have a national fellowship called Next Doc, and we support, you know, filmmakers who are um, between the ages of 20 and 24 through this fellowship, which has really grown over the last four years. And so, you know, we have this larger, large network of young people, essentially between 13 and about, you know, 28, 27 that have gone through our programs. And we've sort of built this, you know, way of them connecting with us through Zoom and through all these other platforms during the pandemic. We've given out um, around seven thousand dollars in, um, you know, oh, yeah, got money. Yeah, well, so what we did is we had funding for a convening <laughs> that we were going to do in Detroit, the Allied right, Media okay. Conference, which I know, you know, Jasiri's definitely, you know, been a part of that before. Some really dope folks in Detroit that have been organizing because he's got One Hood Media, and, so yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, right. and through like you know, folks might have heard of like Adrian Marie Brown and you know, emergency. Might have. We might have heard. <laughs> yeah, you might have heard about her and her book. You know, and it's interesting too. It's like the timing of that book really becoming yes. sort of a guidepost for organizing in the last you know five yes. years. And I feel yes. like, and now we're faced with this kind of like mass kind of reckoning where we have to think about you know how are we going to bring folks together in a in a dynamic and new way because the old ways are just not available to us right so right i feel like young people with their accessibility and knowledge about media can be leaders in sort of like re kind of imagining a way for us to be organized and in community with each other and they're doing that you know and i think so we're just trying to provide that platform for our folks who we've been working with and provide that support. And the last thing I'll say is emotional support has been important like what do you mean by emotional support we need to support each other emotionally I believe it or not we do we're human beings you know what I mean we have hearts and you know even though sometimes you know um we don't see that reflected around the world sometimes but I feel like you know especially young folks it's like they're absorbing not only all the shit that we're all absorbing but I think a level of grief that's in addition to what we're feeling because they're losing things like graduation and prom and like closure right. on their on certain parts of their lives that I think are rites of passage right so we're trying to be responsive to our young folks and be there for them. And some of our older fellows, like they're paying rent, you know, so they need help with stuff like that. So 
it's a wide range of response. And then now kind of thinking about how to bring in some, you know, reimagining of, of what's going to happen after this. No, thank you for saying that. You know, I thought about when you brought up Adrienne Marie Brown, I was thinking about a quote that she has. I'm so quick and nimble with the finger work over here. Uh, she said, we are living in impossible times, quote. If it were fiction, it would be critiqued as hyperbolic. If we were nightmares, we would never sleep. We are living in times created by our own species. Our visions are ropes through the devastation. Look further ahead like our ancestors did. Look further, extend, hold evolve. And just reading that quote from her really shakes me to my core because you're absolutely right. Like this book is so on point. I think about, you know, we don't have to talk about the former president, uh, Barack Obama, but how he was discussing, like, if, should we have another airborne illness like the Spanish flu? Like now is the time to build a container for like how we move through it. And then like, nobody listened to him. It's fine. You know, and so I think about all these great minds that are out here with emerging um, identities and like these emerging thoughts. And like when you say, when I hear you say, well, let the youth like help us redetermine like what it looks like to even have online programming. Like how difficult is it, do you think, um, to actually have an intergenerational space where um, us older folks, you know, the 30 plus group um, can make way well, that one, you know, you might be in the 40 plus group, but how can I'm we, 40 plus. are you 40 plus? Shit. I'm claiming that shit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah 46. That's me. 46. Yeah. Wow. The melanin is here. Uh, <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? 46 is here and the melanin is here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you look up 46. Okay. I got um, good genes. I give, I give props to my mom or dad. Okay. And yeah. so the question I have for you is like, what does it look like on, to, to organize with youth and like let them take the lead because the question begs a lot of elders will say we wish that you know the youth would listen to us and like you understand the complexity of saying that yeah yeah I mean I think I think part of the challenge that um you know older folks who have positionality that is puts them in in in, in a hierarchical relationship with young people is they sort of get locked into that role of like, you know, I have to be, a, when I'm when I'm a teacher, that means I'm also an authoritarian figure. Or when I'm like a mentor, I have to be an authoritarian. When I'm a coach, I'm an authoritarian. And I think we have to redefine that relationship between how we work with young people and see ourselves as mentors, but not as people that are forcing a particular code of being or a particular way of expressing themselves. And I think like every generation is gonna have a different way of expressing it. You know, I think of us as like, we're like, you know, I, I moved to this country when I was 10 years old and I immediately immediately discovered hip hop as a form of like, you know, sort of for me. Isn't hip hop? Yeah, hell yeah. You no, got a hoodie it, on. I mean, how yeah. did I not know this? Okay. All right. <laughs> of course, I got a hoodie. But like the whole thing is like thinking about how like hip hop as like a vehicle for people's thoughts and ideas when it when people were first kind of like, you know, responding to young people who were kind of like in, you know, in that movement of of, of sort of being in rebellion of the of the you know uh, rebellious to towards the culture the mainstream culture that's what hip-hop was about and i think like that's the whole con that's always sort of evolving there's always going to be a way that young people are going to express themselves that's going to feel like rebellious but that's good that's the point you know what i mean and, and the challenge and ain't that, that the would, point right because we have to think about this whole idea of like entrenchment and how we get stuck in the way that we do things and it doesn't right. work you know like there's certain structures that we know you and i know we work in nonprofit, you know, structures as well, we understand they don't work. And part of why they exist is to create structural, you know, differences and to create inequality. You know what I mean? Like at the end right. of the day, we're operating within a capitalist system that relies on scarcity and relies on folks thinking that they need certain things and not getting things that they actually need. Right. So right. there's this whole imbalance that young people see that. And when they come to the table and want to have conversations about it for us, it's like we have to create the space that they feel is an actual authentic real space. We can't come at it like a boss or like we're actually, you know, like I see a lot of older folks who try to sort of work with young people in a way that they're actually like creating these like fake, you know, sort of like um, structures for them to have conversations like councils and like advisory right. board rather than being so like- I see a lot of that youth shit. advisory council right, board. <laughs> right, like give them power, give them actual, you know, agency and give them the tools of the things that you're doing. Like, for example, if you're a leader, 
allow them to understand the structures of leadership, you know, allow them to actually get their hands on. To see you know, how the tenets of leadership are formed. Even. Yeah, right. right. Like run a program, like devise a plan and let them implement it. And it's not always going to be perfect. It's not always going to work, you know, and for me, like a lot of my job, I always say this is my, my, my like, you know, ethos is like, it's not, I never say, I try to never say no. I always say how, right? So if someone's okay. got this idea, I'm like, no, I'm not going to be like, no, you can't do that. And be like, well, if I'm skeptical, I'm going to be like, how are you going to do that? I'm going to challenge you to help me, you know, to sort of like come to where you're at, but I'm not going to just assume that it's a bad idea, you know? And I think right. one thing that YouthFX has developed is this, you know, real level of, of peer mentorship. And it's really like people who are just a couple of years older than each other who have taken a step in the program that are mentoring younger people. And then to the point where, again, our staff is sort of collectively running multiple levels of the program but they're in complete charge so you know like i've been working on my own film for the last three years co-directing are you working on a film yeah with ira um ira mckinley we made a film called the throwaways back in 2014 and this is our in 2014 film. i was reading that in your bio yeah yeah and so this film we finally got you know we were supported by sundance and itbs and you know just films and so we have some actual you know funding so I've been able to go on these, you know, on the shoots it's, and it's, you know, it's a documentary and it's set in Florida where Ira's family's from. It's about his family and, and their history. Mm -hmm. And I've had to leave, you know, like being the, the, you know, in charge, so to speak of the daily operations of youth FX. Cause I'll go for like a 10 day shoot, a 12 day shoot. I was shooting a lot last year and it was actually incredible to watch because so we have these Slack channels and, you know, everything's on Slack. And so I hate I'm Slack, like, but tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, well, it works. It can work to organize lots of different, you know, so okay. work. and again, it's like they kind of were like, let's use this thing called Slack. I was like, oh, God, it's, I had the same reaction. I got to learn one more damn thing. Right. And now I I'm refuse. converted, you know, and oh, so you're I converted. Have, you're like, yeah. this is efficient. Yeah, it works. It works. It works. <laughs> and it's so, nice colors. Look how organized it, it is. It is. You can't do gifts that easily, though. And that's something okay. I'm really not happy about. But we're going to figure okay. that out at some point. But yeah, so we basically, you know, I'm watching from afar as they're running the organization. And for me, it's about like, it's not about me. It's not about my ego. It's about the organization completely being responsive to young people and staying agile and active and right. engaged in critique, engaged in feedback. And also trying stuff out, like taking a chance, taking a risk on a project or a program and not caring if like five people show up to that event the first time you do it. You keep doing that Friday Night Flicks, which was a new thing we started doing. We moved that online where we show a film, a feature film from a director who's a person of color and you know, okay. we have a conversation about it. And young people don't get exposed to that type of, of, of work because we don't have, you know, art house cinemas or like, you know, right. on theaters in this area. So we're trying to become that also so you can say to young folks like you can try out a, an idea or a program and if it works it works i mean we've partnered with former students with folks in the community like i mean you know you've done events at our space it's like we're always trying to just say look we have we have an, a resource which is a space and it's really there to sort of like help young people actualize their ideas and make their you know sort of like the dreams that they have as far as like filmmaking that's our primary goal but it's just a larger structure of saying you actually can accomplish these things. It's not just like a theoretical thing, or let's do a little exercise of like, let's imagine what your, you know, what the city would look like. No, let's actually start implementing what you think the city would look like. Right. Well, wow, that's amazing. And I heard you say earlier that, um, you know, you'd been operating for several years without a space. Like what has, and I'm saying this as an artist who is constantly, you know, before COVID, constantly looking for spaces to host right. events, to hold events, because, you know, these sort of things are important to the community. What do you, what do you say to the conversation of, you know, we need space in order to make these things happen? Because we're, as people of color, I feel like sometimes we're relegated to the corner, like, you know, and so having your space in the location that you have it in, y'all are in the hood, right. you know what I'm saying? Like, what does that mean to set out this, this this four by four essentially of, of, a, of a building and say this is the place where we congregate do the work where we yeah. break bread where you know what does that mean to y'all i mean you know what it, it it means everything in the sense of like it's a hub it's a it's a it's a it's a, mm -hmm. um, it's a meeting place you know what i mean saying so like the energy of the organization is contained in this space and then it can sort of go out so i play it has a place to incubate it can be opened at different hours of the day so we before that, you know, we were really lucky to be working and partnering with the free school and they were offering us space where I used to teach there years ago. 
and you used to you teach know, at the free school. Yeah, I taught you learn something new about people every day. Yeah, okay, I know. So I was there. Um, and my Shout kids out to the free school, y'all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, and that's you know, that's part of where I, I learned a lot about you know how to trust young people and how to trust mm -hmm. kids that they actually you know they want to do things that are productive, positive, generative, you know, creative. Um, and one of the things about, you know, the free school is it allowed us to have our summer program there, but up, of course they were operating the school. So we never really had, you know, anything right. else besides the summer program till 2012 when we started working with the libraries. And then we actually got a space through the library in 2016, but again, it was limited hours according to them. There was noise restrictions. So we never really had a space. And so now that we have a space, it's added this whole different level of foundational you know, kind of like security also. And right. part of it was partnering with the housing authority so that they could give us this like, you know, um, opportunity to have two years rent free. So we didn't have to pay any rent um, because our nonprofits- Y'all was stacking y'all's coins. Like what can yeah. we do to reinvest this money real quick? Right, and the thing about it, you know, it's like people are like, oh my God, you're so lucky and this and that. And I was just like, I want to reframe that and actually have, you know, the conversation be around how Albany Housing Authority should be really, you know, sort of supporting organizations in this way anyways, right? So it's not right. this thing where, again, where we're saying, oh my God, like, how'd you hook it up? And you got so lucky and, oh, y'all are like, this. it's like, no, it's part it's of- It's like you're work. advocating and fighting for it. Like exactly. you're- Exactly. You're right? like, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think yeah. That's the kind of thing we've been working to try and find space and, 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 you know, have a location for years. And it happened to be really kind of designed perfectly for what we needed to, to, to do. But- you know, the whole concept of having a place where people can just drop in and there's going to be someone there, that's a level of security and like, you know, um, resource that a young person needs, right? Like they need to know there's a place they can count on to walk in the door. There's snacks. Like we have a whole drawer full of like- Y'all yeah, be having people. some snacks. I'd be like- Yeah, we got good snacks. <laughs> you know what I mean? We got a water jug. We got like computers that you can get on. Like we have, you know, um, fruit sometimes. You know, we even have like, you know, hygiene and things like that, hygiene goods and things. You Which might is need. important, especially yeah. to folks, especially for folks from the community who may feel some type of way about, you know, asking. It's like you're providing accessibility. Yeah, and that's exactly. something that most adults don't think about. Like, how yeah. can I meet my youth where they're at? You know, exactly. So. And that's the key right there. It's like me. You got them. excited. You was like, exactly. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I'm saying that's it. And that's the thing. I feel like people have like, this is my program and this is how we're going to do it rather than like, what do you need in that community? And like, what are young people, how do we kind of be agile and responsive rather than say, you know, kind of like, these are the things that we do and remain kind of entrenched in one way of doing it, you know? Right. And obviously with this shit happening now, it's like, everything's like in disarray. So the, the folks who have been kind of able to move without this massive sort of bureaucracy that tells them what to do at every step of the game, it's like, like we can do a program like that. Like we're talking to artists right now to create ideas to do virtual programming and we're supporting folks and you know um you know trying to sort of like be a incubator for different ideas in the meantime before we come out like we're talking about doing some outdoor stuff in the summer like right okay how do we kind of think about you know what we're going to be having to adjust to right now because if we don't i'm really worried about us kind of getting like these directives thrown at us and like you and i were talking about like when kids are out in the summertime, are the cops going to be rolling around fucking trying to, you know, harass these kids? Because I've already heard that's happening, right? In city parks and places like, oh, you're not six feet apart or this, you know, these kinds of, right. I understand again, there, there's definitely health concerns we need to be. So I'm going to bring up something real quick. Did you hear about, like, I'm like the T, did you hear about what happened to um, Albany food, not bombs, no. um, that they were handing out food and, you know, the cops came and, you know, Food Not Bombs uh, globally is doing the work of like feeding people no matter where they're at, right? I've and like feeding them with good, good nutritional stuff, right? Um, and so the cops came and they made a post about it. And uh, I was just reading it actually. They made a post about it and it was like the cops were saying exactly what you said. You know, y'all aren't socially distant. How can you socially distance as a homeless person? Like, I mean, you, you know, like the world is the universe and there's so many people in your home. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's just very interesting the way that, that most marginalized people will be treated, poor folks, homeless folks, folks in prison, how can they socially distance, you know? So think about these youth who live in homes of people um, that, you know, adults sometimes get into situations where white supremacy is holding us down and there's gotta be seven people to a house. How can I socially distance, you know, when my cousins and my aunt live here? Like, you know what I'm saying? So. We need to be realistic about where people are at and why actually. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know what I mean? I think that there's also ways that we can start thinking about like, how are we going to also just um, create ways for people to actually access medical care and healthcare if they need it and having more testing centers and, and really kind of helping people. Right. Also, I think one of the things that I'm, you know, we're shifting and trying to adjust to also is do, you know, incorporate education around, you know, COVID and what some of the things that people need to know. Cause I hear a lot of, you know, inconsistencies and in what people say that they know about it. And also there right. are generally are inconsistencies. Like you hear one study today, the next, you know, so even adults, right. even medical professionals right. are, well, we don't really know what's going on. Right. So how do we convey that down to youth in a way that they're trusting? Because it's not a cop telling them that you got to do X, Y and Z, but it's folks in the community educating their young folks to say, look, this is the situation. Um, you know, the other thing I've been thinking a lot about is you got, you know, a generation that you're, I'm looking at, you know, 13 to 30 year olds. Right. Right. This generation where they're kind of like, you know, um, their future is kind of like uh, is 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 hanging in the balance in a way because like, what are the structures of, you know, universities and colleges going to look like, you know, what are the job Ooh. opportunities look like, you know, and you know, I think we're going back to the conversation about space. I think about how accessible colleges are right now and how, like, how many events that I try to have and that college is like, no, you can't because we've got all this programming and the program got sucked up. And, and I think about how much space College of St. Rose takes up, U Albany takes up, you know, um, Sienna, Sage, whatever. I'm not picking on any one college, right? Just how much property space these right. folks take up and that they don't offer it to the community or if they do, you know, that's why I like fucking with you buy one because I feel like anything that we have ever asked you to do. And when I say we, I, I talk about, you know, my smaller community organization, um, Capital District Intersectional Feminist Group. We've been like, we just want to serve books and breakfast. Right. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. And you're like, come on down. Right. Like, you know, it doesn't have to be that complicated. You know, there doesn't have to always be contracts and like agreements right. and all these kinds of things, which again, you know, like we've created all these structures, you know, I think of like the South Campus, you know, Capital South Campus Center and like- That really how, hurts my heart that, that it's not being utilized. Place, you know, right. yeah. And like, again, you know, we're gonna have to be thinking about this because if we, if we really, again, start extrapolating some scenarios, buildings are gonna be going into foreclosure. Right. Folks are gonna be occupying spaces in order to stay because I, I, what I see happening already sort of on the underground is there's going to be a rent strike. It's already happening. People didn't pay their April rent. They're not. Oh, you talking? Oh, you talking about the rent strike? Oh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's you know being I mean? serious on the set. And we, I mean, we have to be honest about what does that look like when it starts filtering down to commercial buildings, right? So you have a commercial space in your community. I mean, you look at the South End of Albany where we're located. That has been divested of consistently and systematically for the last two to three years, we've watched, I mean, it was already under-resourced, it's gotten even more. You don't have a pharmacy anymore. You don't have the stewards, you know? These little sort I of- could, like, It's such a food desert now. You yeah, have, I mean, there's nothing down there, right? So between like- Between the McDonald's happened? that's all the way down on Holland, closer to Albany Med, right. there's one corner store, now maybe two. I don't know what the other one where the right. stewards is. There's two corner stores in a two mile radius in between, you know, places like where you work and like the hospital, you like, you know, so anything. you can't no. find it and you can't find healthy food, no. you know? Um, and then this is how I'm wondering, like thinking about gentrification and like what that looks like, right? When the buildings become so dilapidated, like you go through downtown Albany and when I, I'm from, I'm from Boston. So when I think of downtown, I think of opulence and, and, you know, and you just drive through and you can see how um, there's this, this, I'm gonna say it. There's this requirement of a lot of people in the community to tell community members, oh, well, you need to just clean up your street and and take care of the broken glass and 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 make sure this will make the street safer. No, because we're still not addressing poverty, right? We're still not addressing the lack of education. Okay? And these are the kids that come through your program. And I think what Youth FX does is so amazing because it's revolutionary. Like we're, you and I were talking about this, that there, we're at a point right now where every, almost every kid we know has a phone in their hand. And it's like, they're their own, what's the word when you create a documentary? Are you a director? Director, producer, you know. Okay, yeah. you educated me, cause I don't yeah. know. I'm no yeah. Ava DuVernay, okay? Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? And so these kids essentially, if I think about it in the way that I know, I don't I don't know how to do it. A TikTok, a Snapchat, a a group quorum. I don't, I don't even know what these kids are doing, but I feel like they're creating these. You just really age yourself right there. But. 
<laughs> but I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you keep going. We make quorum, but like, I'm it's going all, I'm right there with order. You. I'm right there with you. And so what does it look like um, to know that kids are creating stories, but there may not be any sort of education or guidance. Like maybe that's something that y'all can do. It's like turn your TikTok into uh, into into like a docu series or, or something like that. I don't know if that unless that's already what's happening. I I don't know. Well, you know, I mean, I I mean, first off, I'm as oblivious about TikTok as you are. Um, Thank you. I I'm needed really, someone on my side. Yeah, I, and it's just like I. It's really I start thinking about it in like the amount of time. Like, yo, some people's Instagram story. I'm just like, yo, this is highly curated. Like, there's right. like, the, like animations and shit on that. I'm like, yo, you took some time. Shout out to you. Right. How did you fit that into your day on such a regular basis to do like four or five posts? And I think like, you know, there's a savviness to it that we just don't get. Like there's a right. generational gap. Like I'm, I'm going to admit it straight up. Like I didn't grow up with that technology. So the kids what, need to yeah. teach us. Yeah, That's they need hilarious. to teach us. Right. And then, and then and then I think what we can sort of offer to them is also a level of like critical thinking around, you know, who is really sort of in control of their image at the end of the day. And how do we really mm. also find ways to sort of decenter the corporate platforms that are really the ones capturing our imagery. I mean, you know, Facebook and Instagram are just the same company. They're owned by the same people. They definitely are. Folks, you know, right. And what are those folks doing for our communities? What are those folks doing for youth, you know, on a structural level? Are they, right. you know, are they actually creating space for power? You know, I would say no, that's my guess. And unless someone wants to prove that otherwise, like I don't see those platforms turning ownership over to young people in any direct way where, you know, the monetization of stuff like that's still like in the hands of their sort of algorithms and things like that. So, you know, as much as I love these platforms myself as a form of communication, and now we're really reliant on them, I think it's important for us also to reimagine what social media looks like and think about mm. the ways that that can be a different space because none of those platforms do everything we want, which is why they're right. all that we have so many of them. And, then and that's why it's so useful. I'm so glad yeah. you said that because I want to yeah. share an aside if I could. Yeah, please. Thank you. So there was a woman who posted, um, there was a woman who posted, you know, she was talking about, you know, sports bras and like how they're all ugly once you get past a certain boob size, you know? And I agreed with the woman's point, but she was doing the clap. She was like, well, let me tell you oh, yeah. and it was like it was like on the ones and threes and really like because you know I've, I've been actually explaining this I'm in a in a Facebook group where I've actually been explaining it someone was like it was ratchet clap I was like there's no such thing as ratchet clap it's an actual musical accompaniment and they were like it's just words I'm like words have rhythm never tell a poet mm -hmm. it's just words mm -hmm. <laughs> like you know what I'm saying like right. and so I was explaining the twos and fours but um I've noticed that there, and, and maybe you can speak to this, maybe you can't, but I just want to share it. But I noticed that, I'm going to tell you what happened because I feel like my, my head does that sometimes. So I posted, I commented on the, on the tweet and I was like, I'm trying to figure out, I'm just wondering how you clap this out because I just read this out loud and it's structurally inefficient for me. Like there, no point has now been made. Like, you know, and so I realized that it didn't get any interaction, but what I had to say was important. And it doesn't get any interaction because I feel like sometimes if you don't have so many followers, Twitter obscures your yeah. commentary, oh, yeah. right? Definitely. Um, and, and then like, if I post the same thing, if I take a screenshot of what I say and I post it to Insta, I might get some engagement. But when I post it to Facebook, people who don't engage with Twitter um, will be like, oh my God, I agree with you. And da, da, da. so it's like, I like that you said, <clears throat> each platform has something different. And mm -hmm. if it had all in one, we'd all be using that one, like, you know, and someone accused me inside of the, the private Facebook group, delete my post. Um, it went semi-viral in the group and um, they were saying, what you're clout chasing. Um, and I was like, no, this is how the social media works. You have to promote yourself. I don't think it's advertising so much mm -hmm. as saying, I know once no one is seeing this because of the algorithms on this app, right? Like, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. this is quality content. Like, and then I, I had to, I was, my little petty meter came out, Bowen, and I was like, this is the girl's profile. She has 3,000 followers. I raised you 14,000 followers. I, I don't think I have to clout chase. Like, right, you know what I'm saying? Right. But it was just interesting that you say that because um, I do think about user usability. I think about 
um, how many times folks have gotten kicked off the platform for just being and existing. And I was actually on a phone call uh, this afternoon with Facebook about like their updates during COVID-19 and how they've scaled back <clears throat> on the production. You know, everyone's working from home, but you can't have certain Facebook employees accessing people's accounts from home. Like that mm -hmm. just opens up a whole different thing. And so I don't know, I'm wondering like what it looks like when you say that we can redefine what social media is. I'm actually making myself a note to um, reach out to the Facebook strategy team and ask them like are as much as they're curating space for women or black women, like they have all these groups that they're protecting, like who's protecting the youth. And so I'm making myself a note of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I, I don't have any answers to like what necessarily like a platform looks like that kind of, you know, fulfills all those different things. But I also, and I also completely agree with you about how the algorithms, you know, sort of shape the way that people are being, you know, sort of, uh, in my opinion, just sort of like engaged with, or maybe even programmed, if you want to be really kind of just mm, right. about it, because that's something that I'll see we're in it about, you know yeah I mean that's the kind of thing I've been starting to think about is like what are the ways that like when we're really like I was literally just having this conversation with Darian today I was like we are now literally spending the majority of our time interacting with screens in a way you know we were already like oh my god you're on screens too much we're on screens too much and especially right. young people you always tell them get off your screens and all that but now that's like it's a means of connection like it's the only right. thing that connects us right so how does that then start to reshape the way that we sort of have relationship with people in different ways that, you know, I think in some ways can be hidden to us because, you know, it is based on likes and interactions and content and things like that. And like, I've been trying to just interact with people in a way that's positive on certain levels and then right. also interject, you know, in folks that are trying to be sort of like political and engage with those conversations. Cause I think both are really important. Like it's important for us right now to stay emotionally grounded, supported, meditate, take care of ourselves. Listen, that as much as we, we were can. talking about that. And I was actually, remember yeah. I said, I was surprised. You were like, take your nap, Dee Dee. Yeah, be no, tired, that. acknowledge we that. And I was that. like, yeah. you weren't mad that I overslept. Well, this, that right. was really helpful for me because I I'm a person who lives with anxiety and I'm just like, coming to this call like I'm so sorry and you're like no do what you guys do like, like okay, you know? no. yeah I mean my wife's a midwife so I'm used to having um you know a partner who's on call and, and rest is a super important thing that she needs to actually you know center all the time because her work is really intense there's no like time off that is, midwife, that is intense. Right? Yeah. like you're just there when the babies are coming and so part of the thing that's you know important for us is like as we interact with these social media platforms and they become so overwhelming now like you're talking about the zoom stuff like literally zoom is going to make you tired like just right. this is not you know it's not like here's the thing if like you and i were sitting in a space having a conversation there'd be a, also an energy that's being exchanged right that's in real time that's a tangible thing that doesn't exist right now there's like right. this, you know there's you know we're laughing we can smile we can have you know like have a good time and have emotional responses but there's something missing because we're not in real time together right and so for young folks like i think it's important to help them sort of you know sometimes navigate especially the information because i've been having some conversation with some of the some of our young folks in our, in our programs how so, are they you know, feeling kind of, now you know i i feel like um i've reached out to some folks that i know are youth organizers and it's like covid19 the coronavirus is draining all of us especially yeah. the youth and so like yeah. what are what are they coming up with like you know like how yeah, are the a lot of them are just they're just really sad, you know, they're sad and I think they're angry. And I think some of them are also, you know, young people today, a lot of them have anxiety. A lot of them already have, you know, a lot of sort of like emotional um, challenges that they're dealing with. And I think that in a way, you know, what we do at the core of what we're doing at YouthFX is community building and also, you know, offering a space for like, you know, rejuvenation and, and, and a little bit of, you know, reclamation of yourself because you know kids spend most of their day in school settings where in essence like you're you're sort of have to shift the way you behave as a human being to adjust to right. that structure you know socially and all that stuff and then the and also uh like massachusetts just shut down schools yeah, uh, so for the rest of the down. year yeah and new york yeah, city i don't have no great. idea what albany is about to do because new I mean, york it's city gonna just... happen you know it's just a matter of time i mean there's no way that schools are going to remain open for for the for any you know there's no more schooling in the buildings. and anymore. so like what what kind of effect does that have exactly. do you have any tips for parents who are home with look at my baby's coming back this saturday do you have do you have any tips for parents whose children will be home and like you said it's like 
it's kind of like cooped up. Like, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to put on a schedule where I'm like, I'm working nine to five. And as I told you, sometimes I violate my own nine to five. I find myself keeping up with uh, the fact that we're living amidst a pandemic, right? right? And, and parenting and also trying to clean my house and then being okay with not having the house clean because I'm in a terrible mood today. And you know, how, what, what advice, if any, do you have for parents who are home with their children about activities or, or, or even conversations that they could be having um, surrounding this? Yeah. I mean, you know, look, so my kids are really, my kids are grown now. They're 20 and 22. And they, you don't they even <laughs> look like you have kids older than five, Bowen. Uh, that, that's why, that's my secret. Yeah. You, you just, just work with young people and it'll help you stay young. Um, but then, then, then your, your knees kind of like, you know, remind you every once in a while, like, yo, you're not their age, dude. You know what I mean? Right. So, right. Time. You're like, let me, let me set out this ball game real quick. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, so but, you know, I think like the, the you know, my, my sister has little kids um, and I've been talking to her a lot. She lives in Atlanta and, you know, she's working from home. And so it's been kind of like that's been like kind of like the flip side. Right. It's like I've found like, so, you know, really deepening relationships with some family members that we've all been so busy over the last few years. We haven't really communicated that much. And one of the things that we've talked about is she's just like, I've let go of this idea that we're going to have a schedule and productivity and this and that. Mm. And the thing that I would really, you know, and I always recommend is, you know, because again, just working as a teacher, it's like the idea that like you can involve your kid in the schedule, like you can have a conversation with them. Right. Kind of understand. Like today might look different. What right. do you got going on? Right. Like, you know, and exactly. Let's do a temperature check with one yeah, another. Exactly. You know? A check in, right. a little family meeting. You know, we used to do family meetings and we used to just sit and, you know, and one thing that I always, you know, for me was a grounding thing. And I can only imagine now, you know, this is the one thing we do with our kids now. You know, they, we live apart from them and they come and visit us. And we just kind of like walk around outside and then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll do a very like, you know, shared meal, but it's like all you things, you know, my wife is a health professional and her level of understanding how to do all this is like mind boggling because she's got to do it every day, you know, like, right. She's like, pass the potatoes to your brothers. So they, <laughs> right. It's all, it's all organized and like different utensils for different things. And, you know, and we do that like, you know, once every, we've done it, try to do it once a week and it's really stressful and I miss my kids. But at the same time, you know, they're not little kids who, you know, they're independent. So for the younger right. kids, I think it's important to sort of create some kind of like grounding thing, like a meal time together so that there is some sense. Because I think even like myself, like food for me in this during this whole thing, like has been really something that I've, you know, felt is like a privilege and a blessing when I'm seeing other folks who I, you know, see on the news. And I know people in our community that are, that don't have, you know, food security right now. And that's the right. one thing that I've ventured out to do. I'm working with Feed Albany, which is an incredible organization that's come together um, to help feed folks in Albany and also the South End Children's Cafe. So we've supported those two organizations yeah. by just offering okay. them like visual documentation to help them access like funders or just to articulate the need in a visual way that can draw people's, you know, sort of like, um, um, uh, donations right because again right. like we're using you know we use the we have to use these tools to have people connect you know and i think that's one of the things about what's happening in the news is so overwhelming that people disconnect from the news but we right. should really be informed in what's going on i mean i think you should be informed on the federal level as well but we need to know what's going on in our communities because right right know, the need cannot be ignored and so for myself as someone that has that security i've been like really like appreciative of that you know ability to cook a meal and i think if you have that mm. ability to do that with family is really important right now um and, and that's something that we miss with our kids because we used to always you right know, be together we had it you know we had yeah. food time was like the you know the time we would really um, make commitments to to be there and you know, food is something, you know, it's a time to share, you know, also like just how people are feeling. And I think checking in, like I've been checking in with my kids two, three times a day, just text right. calls. We do right. FaceTime every couple of days and we're just always like, how you doing? Just checking in, you know? And like, that's the kind of thing where I feel at the end of the day, I hope that people have a different appreciation for relationship and right. like, you know, like, like a hug is like, you know, like I just, you know what I mean? Like I'm someone that needs, I love hugging people and we, you know, right. we, we really like, you know, uh, center care and, 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 um, and, and, you know, um, looking out for each other and love in our space and our work and youth FX. And I think like, that's the thing that we have to understand, like when that's not there, like, you know, you have to sort of like make sure that there's some connection to, to, to our needs being met and food is one way and, and, and just conversation and asking people how they're doing is super important. And 
not getting caught up in your own stuff when you have kids. Cause I think with kids, you know, you guys, you're busy, you're working full time and then you got to have a child, you know, and, and right. take care of their needs. So I think it's important for plus for that. I'm a community organizer. You're I think that like, I'm like, I'm not doing anything. I, I feel bad. And then I'm like, I'm producing, you know, a podcast and I'm trying to get people money. Like, you know, so I yeah. mean, I don't know what's happening half the time. Yeah. So. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate yeah. that. I want to talk about movies. Yeah. So what are you watching? What's in your Netflix queue? Oh my God. Do, you, do, you know, do, so do film directors like, watch Netflix? Yeah. Oh yeah. No, we watch Netflix. Yeah. Do we watch the Netflix? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's been, it's, it's interesting. It's like, I haven't really watched as much as I thought I would watch. Um, and I think part of it is that I am so kind of like in front of screen so much that honestly, like when I'm, cause I'm working still from home and, you know, we're kind of trying to do some, some, some support calls and things like that. So like, you know, this is the norm for me to kind of be like done around this time of the day right. with conversations and zoom calls and like these little, you know, like mini solidarity calls we've been doing with our staff and our fellows. Right. That's and so, so dope. I'm just kind of like out, you know, like I kind of like sometimes check out in that way at night. And so I just kind of like zone out or I'm just like, you know, listening to music and having a drink and just like, trying to be you know still a little bit because I think that's one thing that I've noticed is like I'm there's a lot of interaction which is even though a lot of human doing instead of yeah right and then there's just a general like shit is out there you know I mean like you wake up you know I don't know if you have this experience but I wake up in the morning and then like you know like a few minutes or even sometimes it's like seconds I'm like oh fuck there's a fucking like virus and like I mean it's just crazy it's like you just you know what I mean it's like it's so like it's still not not like you know it's not normal and it isn't normal it's like right. I said it, it, there is this level of like you know dystopia that we have to sort of like um come to terms with and, and accept because that's the only way we're going to really like move forward through it right you know? but but one of the things that I feel you know really connected to is supporting the work of filmmakers that are um currently working and getting their films out so what i have been watching actually is a lot of um new films that didn't get released yet because their festival screenings got canceled and things like that and so what we're doing as an organization through our next doc program is we're partnering with some of these filmmakers to do these private screenings of their work okay. and sort of generate interest because the challenge is you know that some of them can't release it online yet because they've literally counted on that, you know, income as filmmakers who a lot of them, you know, don't have, you know, full-time jobs outside of the money they can raise as freelance filmmakers and artists, right? right? So, you know, one of the things we're, we're recognizing is that in our field of film, you know, folks of color just started getting like a level of access that we've never had before. And like I said, YouthFX has been having a great, you know, year in the sense of like building access and then therefore access for our young folks. And then that's all sort of cut off, right? So, Right. The industry sort of adjusts to just the basic things of things being closed down and you can't go to see movies. And so there's a whole level of like, you know, sort of disruption that is never sort of unprecedented. Right. And I think for me, it's like we're trying to make sure we center our filmmakers um, in our community who are primarily women and filmmakers of color who what? careers are like, you know, their careers are tenuous. You know, they're not. Right. They're not white, you know, young white dudes who've, who've come from a legacy of money and they're able to make films like they want to make because they don't have to worry about financing them or getting a grant. And right. so we're okay. trying to really um, be a support for them. So I've actually been watching a lot of films that I can't even like talk about because they're not out yet. And I want to like help find ways to advocate for filmmakers to somehow create virtual screening series. So we're working on that. Um, all that stuff's on our, on our website. Um, I'm Instagram, really excited. Facebook, we're also going to share your website too. So it's yeah. The donation link is pinned right now um, as a pinned cool, comment, but you. also when we post oh, it, yeah. when we post it to the podcast, it's going to be in the description right up top, you know, so I'm really excited about this. Um, I have a small request. Yeah. Now, you know, this is what brown folk do when we get together. Um, there is a movie that I watched this weekend. It's called The Invisible Guardian. And I think the director's name is Fernando Gonzalez Molina. And this movie took two and a half hours out, out of my life. Uh, the suspense was amazing. He's a Spanish uh, uh, born um, director. Um, and it didn't matter that it took that two and a half hours out of my life because then I watched the follow up. So it's a trilogy, I didn't know, right? And that, this is what Netflix had me on. And then I watched the follow up, which was The Legend of the Bone. And then when you just said that sometimes films aren't getting released because COVID-19 is like global, right? And he's in Spain. Oh. It seems like his movie, Ofrenda a la Tormenta, 
has not been released in English yet, nor has, but it's the third installation in the trilogy and it was just released on March 27th. And oh, I'm like, wow. how sway? How was it released? What movie theater did it go to? Uh, I need a copy of this film. <laughs> I need that. So the, put, send it in the chat. I, we have like okay. a bunch of different places we look for films. So I'll just tell you this. I am not, I am nothing of a cinephile or a film like, um, you know, geek and expert as YouthFX crew, the rest of them. Like, I want to shout them out because they're the ones that yes. actually put me onto a lot of films. Like, okay. you know, like Darian, Aiden, Michael, Rashid, Jeanette, like Ijanaya. Shout Matt, out to the like, crew, love. Our okay. whole crew. Yeah. Like, they're constantly watching stuff and being like, did you see this? You haven't watched it. Did you watch that yet? You right. know, and so like, there's part of that is really, you know, part of our like, you know, community is about putting people onto shit because, like you said, right. it's like, you might find some obscure movie that no one's ever told you about. And if you don't tell like your friends about it, like they may never see that movie, you know, like. I want to tell all my friends about it. Tanya Fields, I was texting her and she was like, I forget what we were talking about. And I said, do you have two and a half hours to kill? And she was like, what is wrong with you? I was like, you have to watch this movie. And then after that, you have to watch it. She goes, I'm a, she was I'm be live tweeting you as, as I'm watching it. I'm just so excited about films like you know and yeah. I think about someone like Ava DuVernay yeah. um you know when we talk about the youth and then we talk about like the older folks right she went from corporate America to like you know the, the 13th and when they see us and it's like you know what tips do you have for folks who are outside of your youth bracket and namely me 20 to 24 <laughs> 36, right? Like, what does it look like for folks to just follow their dreams? We're at a, a pivotal shift right now. COVID-19 is kind of shaking the table, like, you know? Yeah. So what, what suggestions do you have for someone who is like, well, I'm, you know, I'm interested in film and, and, and producing, but I don't know where to start. Yeah. I mean, I think it's like, it's such a, I mean, it's like a crazy time to try and like, you know, answer that question, especially because there's so much like, you know, precarity and like, you don't know what the fuck's going to happen. Right. To be honest. But what's right. interesting also, though, I think there's, you know, it's a time for people who have been able to sort of rethink or maybe like re kind of assess like what they're doing and how much they want to pursue some of those things. Like, I know I've thought about things that I've wanted to do and haven't done yet up to this point and been like, damn, do I really want to, you know, give that a shot, you know? Um, and I feel like, Quilting. And, that, and that comes to like my creative work and like writing right. things that I've sort of been like just an idea phase and just let sit there, you know, like I want to do this, we we're talking about doing a podcast, you know, my son and I doing a podcast, sort of like an intergenerational podcast. And and um, so now we've sort of do this thing, we've kind of like had this opportunity to think about that idea. But I mean, honestly, like the only thing I can say about that is that I feel like my number one advice for folks is to write. And I think to write about, mm. to think about the ways that, you know, you're, the stories you want to tell and to actually start writing those stories out. And I think right. one thing that we do have actually at YouthFX is we did develop a program with the Albany Public Libraries okay. that was open for um, any age group. And it was actually an incredibly diverse group of folks that did the program. It was last year. And again, another program that was literally in the works and, you know, we were about to start rolling some of those out, which we did a screenwriting um, series and we did a camera series and then we did a okay. series. So we basically tried to cover the three, you know, kind of central things you need to understand. Because my whole thing also is that folks who are interested in film and like filmmaking, like what you just said, watching films is the number one way, you know, right. right now, like there's so much content out there. And I think part of, you know, the challenge is having like a, a sense of like curation mm. and we, you know, that's one thing that like we do with our, um, one of the things that's been the most successful program we've done online right now is we do a weekly film analysis class where the, okay. the staff will pick out three films and like people take turns and they kind of are, they're short films, but they're connected through a theme um, it might be like a personal narrative or like right. a style or an aesthetic approach. Um, and then they just talk about it as a way to, again, learn and share and kind of like inspire each other creatively. Right. Um, get people thinking about the process of filmmaking. So my my only advice at this stage is to be like thinking about like what you're actually, you know, what specific thing you want to do. If you want to be a camera person, there's incredible workshops that are online. Right. And some of them you can do with your phone. Like you can learn concepts of filmmaking with a phone because it's really about how you compose a shot and that thing that's the same whether you're using a phone or a, a camera right. it's just a different level of technology you know but you know I think it's it's a time when there's anybody can make content but get anybody can make content well, I got a show now okay yeah, show. anybody can do? make content who knew it you got a show
Maybe I got a show. Okay. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, um, I think about art, right. And, 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 and how people view artists and how like, you know, um, it, there's sort of a parallel if you think about it between how people view the youth and how people view artists, right? Like these things aren't really important until we get forced to be in the forefront. Um, and I think about just like how many people don't realize, I love that you said it's content curation, right? And just trying to streamline, how many people don't realize how much art is in the world through film and, and TV and media and that someone had to create it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, several someone's got together. And so um, I just appreciate this conversation with you so much, Paul, and it's not even funny. Yeah, thank you for having you brought me. like a whole new fresh perspective and I appreciate you talking about the programs. I didn't know that YouthFX was doing so much and it, it does make sense that a lot has been on hold. So I'm looking forward to anything y'all are sharing that I can amplify. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely check out the IG lives on Fridays. The film. Oh, y'all got IG? Okay. Yeah, so the, the film posts on Friday morning. This this week we're doing a film called Stacks on Deck, which was a film that was made in 2013, I think. Um, and these are short films. And then we bring on the, we're going to have the two lead actors are going to come on and do a Q&A um, for okay. that 7 p.m. Um, and then we're going to be doing some some more public events, partnering with folks like um, Illuminate Theater, and you know okay. potentially doing some events with like some some music and some DJs. We're just kind of like experimenting with the form, and I think the biggest barrier is like when you get that moment when things freeze and you start stuttering. Yep. Come like, on, yeah, lad. Yeah. I'm like, I hate this. I hate right. it here. <laughs> like anybody who was watching the Teddy Riley baby face battle. I, like, I refuse was, to watch it because I don't want to engage with the memes in a more meaningful way. So I'm just like, I'm not, was, I refuse. <laughs> yeah, it was comedy, um, you know. But again, it's like we're trying out, we're experimenting with ways that, and people are connecting. And, you know, on your note, it's like, I hope people really kind of appreciate the fact that in this particular time and, you know, moment, like art is the thing that's kind of feeding our souls and, and helping mm -hmm. us kind of like move through things. And whether that is from like, you know, you know, films, music, you know, writing, like I think like creativity is has always been sort of a catalyst for mass social change and awakening. And, mm -hmm. you know, to me, like that's what's gonna help us get us through this. We need creativity in all sectors of, of, of the world right now because the old ways of doing shit are, 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 I mean, look, one thing we can say is today, you know, like the oil market completely collapsed, right? So the, the production of oil right now is like, is going to be massively disrupted, right? So like, what does that mean for the planet? And how, what does that mean for us as human beings, you know? And, and how does art and kind of like film and music, you know, play a role in really helping us to shape a new way? Because, you know, and, and you know, as amidst all the sadness, which is just like, you know, it's very overwhelming, the grief and, and you know, I've had, Luckily, my family's been safe and healthy, but I've had many, many friends of mine who have lost um, family members, and it's it's been devastating to see it. And you know, when when we do have a moment to sort of like you know kind of reflect on that, it's overwhelming. But as we kind of come into this place of reemerging from you know quarantine, right. we're going to have to have space where we can express and be creative in how we process what we experience right. because right. I think we can't even process it right now because we're in it, you know? And again, folks are trying to survive, you know? Like folks are thinking about their rent and how their, you know, their child right. is going to be able to sort of like graduate, you know, and, and, and do something, you know, um, what their next step is in life. So I think like once we get to a place where we can even process it, art is going to be there to to really kind of you know, as a container right absolutely yeah right. it really is. that theme has been coming up all the podcasts so yeah. thank you yeah um i want to say thank you for joining me i have one last question i ask everyone this question it's a two-pronged question and hopefully i'll get to the point where i have to stop explaining it to people and i can just ask the question right um the first question i have is um after now that we've done this show, was there anything you were surprised that I didn't ask you? Or was there a question that you were dying to answer? And number two, um, if you were in the audience watching the show, who would you like to see on the show next? Ooh, good question. Thank you. Um, I curate I'm, things. I'm, I'm going to give you an easy one for the second part of the question. And that is, I want to see Jasiri on here because I got, I got it. Yeah. I'm going to, he, he did text me and he said, uh, yeah, no, yeah, because he, you know, he's he's an OG in this work, and I think like it's important for us to remember that people have been doing this work for a long time, and the organizing component of this work is super important, and it translates. It's intersectional to other movement building, and I feel right. like media 
has always sort of been this under, you know, kind of like appreciated field. And I think like, honestly, it's it, you, you look at a lot of the young folks who are in leadership and organizing, and a lot of them have roots in, in youth media because it's a place where they can, something snap for them. Right. And they're like, oh shit. Like, I understand how like image is created. I understand like the way that I can get a message out. And that's a deep, you know, awakening because we're so used to just accepting what's coming at us reality wise and media wise. And, um, and so for the first part, I really just enjoyed the conversation, you know, and I think part of it for me is like, I'm just, you know, always willing to, I could talk about youth FX all day. And I think like, it's something that I'm super passionate about because it's like family to me, you know, and I think right. like, you know, I appreciate just the kind of like, um, you know, the conversational aspect of it and this being just keeping it real, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, right. you know, we don't have to have any fancy, you know, sort of questionnaires and all these like. And heretofore. <laughs> yeah, I don't need all that shit. Just have a conversation, you know, and hopefully some folks out. I don't even know who's watching or listening or, you know, I don't know how we can define that out, but I hope some folks got something out of it and, uh, you know, feel free to reach out. They will. Yeah. And like I said, since this will be transmuted to like other avenues and platforms, actually someone who just texted me was like, and what do you, what else do you need? Like, I'm like, I need everything, you know? Um, as it will be, you know, transcribed on YouTube and the Southern that it'll make it more accessible. Yeah. And so, you know, the links will stay like, you know, so you, you spending this hour and a half with me, I'm hoping I'm calling on the ancestors to exponentially bless us all, like, you know, so thank you so much thank for appearing you. on the show. Thank with you. All right. Thank you. I hope you have a great night. And this has been another sure. episode of the full set. Y'all have a great evening.